it's your turn. It's time. <laughs> Do you guys remember Samantha from last year with where she deconstructed a gown or we reconstructed a gown and she <laughs> how to get dressed to Tudor style? That was fantastic. Yeah, people are saying they loved it. It was amazing. Oh, thank so you. You thank are you. back. Yeah. So for people who don't know you, you are a tailor at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. Yes. And you research historical clothing. Yeah. And you've got a new theme for your talk this year. I on do. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to turn it over to you. And then okay. at the end, when people have questions, um, I'll read them out to you. But for now, I'm just going to turn it right over to you. Okay. okay? I'm going to hopefully share my screen. So are you the co-host? Let me make you the co-host. Oh, okay. You are the co-host. Now you awesome. should be able to share your screen. Okay. People love your glasses, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it seems like um, they're even more important nowadays with wearing masks. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So do you see the button to share your screen? Oh. Now there we go. Sense. Oh, there she is. Is it working? Yep, sure is. Okay. All right. So let me go to. There you are. Okay. Wow. Is it working? Can everybody see <laughs> once yeah. it comes up? Awesome. Maybe. Yay. There it is. Awesome. Okay, good. It's always kind of a bit of a miracle when things actually happen. Technology worked. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, so this is um, a talk that sort of picks up where I left off um, last year's TudorCon. I really focused on the clothing worn during Henry's reign and worn um, by his wives because I did sort of a little poll in the TudorCon group and that was the topic that got the most votes. But the other topic I um, wanted to offer was how fashion changed during Elizabeth's reign. And since that one um, was the runner up, I thought it would be perfect to do this time around. Um, and it's, it's such a fascinating thing because she did reign for a really long time. And even though we sort of have this generalized idea of, you know, our image of Elizabeth, actually a lot happens during this time. So the image here on the right is, I think, kind of the, the stereotypical image that we picture in our heads or that most people, you know, the average person on the street probably pictures when they hear Queen Elizabeth. And it's really imposing. It's a huge dress. She has a huge ruff and a veil and all these sorts of things going on. It looks really unnatural, probably uncomfortable. And it's kind of condensed into the image on the left, which is your very stereotypical Halloween costume idea of Elizabeth, where we have, again, the big rough um, framing the face, a big dress. But where does all that come from? How much of this is real? And we know that Elizabeth was very particular about her image, especially when the portrait on the right was painted near the end of her life. She really wanted to maintain and project an image of majesty and power. So even though this is the image that most of us have in our heads, this isn't how Elizabeth looked or how fashion looked for the whole of her reign. In fact, the image that we associate with Elizabeth here on the right is really only from the ending years of her life. So I wanna look at what was being worn throughout her reign by her and by other noble women, as well as some lower, women lower down on the social scale as well, so that we can see that fashion during Elizabeth's reign was not a monolith. It actually changed quite frequently and everybody was interested in keeping up with those fashions however they could. So I actually want to backtrack just a little bit to start with fashions during the time when Elizabeth was princess right before she became queen. So this would be in the late 1540s and this is a really lovely group image of the family as Henry wanted the family to be known showing his true wife, Jane, um, Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth there. And this is probably one of the earliest images that we have depicting Elizabeth as princess. 
the clothing that Elizabeth wears in the 1540s still has what we consider to be very much the Tudor or Henrician look with the very wide sleeves. Um, and in fact, in the 1540s is when the sleeves get to their absolute widest and it's balancing out the skirt, which has also gotten very wide. Um, you also notice in both Mary and Elizabeth, the neckline, while somewhat shallow, is still very wide, almost coming off of Elizabeth's shoulders in that case. And it's very square as well. To mirror this, you'll notice that the hair and the French hood have started to become less round and a little more oval, and it starts to widen at the sides here. And another interesting thing, particularly in relation to Elizabeth during the 1540s, is that while we know that Ca Queen Catherine of Aragon was very influential in bringing the Spanish farthingale or the hoop skirt to England, it really was not widely adopted after she brought it. Um, it was probably seen as just sort of an odd Spanish fashion, but over time it became widely adopted as the fashion um, became for wider skirts. So by the 1540s, farthingales are being worn pretty regularly by noble and elite women. And the very first reference that we have to a farthingale in the royal wardrobe is a farthingale that was made for Elizabeth. And it was made in 1545 out of crimson silk satin. And the farthingale that you see here on the left is currently the only known extant or surviving farthingale. And this is actually made out of yellow linen and it's stiffened with what were called bents in the period. And these were long dry grasses or reeds that were bundled together sort of like a rope that was then inserted into the channels. And this would help hold out the skirts and you see some Spanish women um, on, the, on the right here depicted wearing their farthingales and the skirts have been tucked up and you can see them there. So basically from the 1540s forwards, we're going to see um, farthingales in their various forms being worn um, in fashion. Once we get into the 1550s, the sleeves start to become smaller once again. They're still big, but they're not the same width that we saw in the 1540s. It also becomes very fashionable for women to wear dark, usually black partlets um, to fill in the neckline of the gown. So as we saw earlier on Elizabeth and Mary, the necklines were open showing their chest and neck. It becomes fashionable to fill that in with a, another garment that was worn on top called a partlet. And it could be either black velvet, like the ones that you see here, and they also have embroidered linings and they flare out like that. Or you could also wear a linen partlet and I'll show some images of that later. I also really want to point out that their French hoods have gotten a bit more square and a bit wider at the top. Um, and this is something that continues throughout the 1550s. But that type of gown is not the only gown that's being worn. Um, at any given decade, there's going to be very different types of styles that are worn um, so that people can suit their clothing to their activity, the weather, whatever they have going on, and to their own personal style. These gowns are interesting because it's a style that you're going to see in one form or another throughout the rest of the century. And it's basically a gown that is loose or semi-fitted that is then worn over an underdress called a kirtle. And in the portrait of Mary, as well as Elizabeth Lady Cavendish, they're both wearing these long, loose gowns um, trimmed with fur, and they're worn over kirtles, which you can't really see too much in this image here. You can see a little bit of the skirt of Mary's kirtle um, peeking out from under her gown, but we'll look at some other images later. One thing that I also wanna point out here on both of these women is that they have a little ruffle around their neck, which is probably attached to a linen partlet and I'll, I'll show you more of those in a second. But this is really important because if this is the beginning of the rough that we so strongly associate with Elizabeth's reign and with fashion from the Elizabethan period, this is where it starts in the 1550s, this tiny little ruffle. So these are linen partlets. Um, the example on the left is an extant or surviving partlet. It doesn't have a collar, 
um, but because they could sometimes be attached and taken off because it's easier to launder um, when you have these separate elements. The partlets on the right might look a little funny because they're actually taken from images of laundry that's being done. So you may have to turn your heads sideways a little bit to see them, but these partlets have collars with attached ruffles on them um, that could be set and ironed into the figure eight shapes that you see. And I'll talk about more about ironing and starching ruffs a little bit later. But you can see these are just simple pieces that get tucked into the neckline. These examples all have strings which help keep it um, tied around the chest and help keep it down underneath the neckline. And this is an example of a woman and her husband, a knight and a gentlewoman. So they're not the most elite, um, but it's a nice example, a little bit more full length image um, of what that sort of loose or semi-fitted gown looks like when worn over um, the kirtle. And you can see the skirt of the kirtle underneath the gown here. This gown also has both the puffed sleeve on top at the shoulder, and then there's a long hanging sleeve that kind of goes down the side of the body there, which doesn't really serve any purpose except for fashion. So now we get to Elizabeth as queen. And I, I think everybody's familiar with this portrait, but it's important to point out that this is actually a copy of the original coronation portrait that was lost. So we don't know exactly um, you know, how closely this followed it, probably very closely, but just again, to be taken with a grain of salt, it may not accurately represent 1550s fashion because it was painted 50 years later. But in the 1550s, these are now the earliest images that we have of Elizabeth as queen. And what is so striking to me about these images is how different Elizabeth presents herself and her clothing to Elizabeth at the end of her reign. In both of these portraits, she's wearing similar gowns to what we saw on Mary and Lady Elizabeth, where it is a long black semi-fitted gown worn over um, a kirtle or an underdress. And while everything about them does indicate wealth and status, the black color being very hard to achieve, so true black was a sign of wealth and status. She's wearing gowns trimmed in ermine, which of course was restricted by sumptuary law to being worn by the royal family and all that gold. There's still an understated um, luxury about it, which is very interesting. I want to point out that the image on the right of Elizabeth, she is wearing a French hood, but the veil has been flipped up over her head. And this is something that you'll see in portraits throughout the rest of the 16th century. It was just a, a popular um, thing to do sometimes if you felt like it in the same way that you see um, the veil of gabled hoods earlier during the Henrician period getting flipped up in all sorts of different ways, just something to change up your style. But again, this combination of wearing a long semi-fitted gown over kirtle, we're going to see throughout the century, and this is sort of the 1550s version. Um, as we move into the 1560s, again, we have the long, loose, semi-fitted gown worn over kirtle, and here you can see the kirtles um, much more clearly on Elizabeth and both Lady Burley here. And one thing that you'll also notice is that there's a lot more emphasis being placed on the shoulders in the 1560s. You get either puffed sleeves that again have additional slashing and puffing on them, but there's this emphasis to create width there at the shoulders, but the rest of the sleeve is very much closely fitted to the arm. You'll also notice that the ruff has grown larger since the 1550s, but it's still pretty restrained, especially as we'll see later on in the century. Here is another version of that semi-fitted gown. Um, and it, this one fits more closely to the body than we've seen previously. This one is also fastened from the neck down to the waist. And there's actually aglets or little ties that go all the way down the rest of the gown so that you could close it completely. But here again, you see emphasis at the shoulders, but still a slim fitting sleeve the rest of the way down. This one has that loose over gown um, 
probably not as fitted as the other examples that we've seen and it falls away from the body a little bit but again that emphasis at the shoulders through all of the puffs and this is just a quick um, series of me in my fitted um, 1560s gowns so that you can see the layers that are underneath. Um, on the left, I'm starting out in my smock, my linen smock, which is the women's basic undergarment. And then I have a petticoat, which is made out of red wool, the bodies, which is the period term for the bodice or the upper part of the garment, has no boning in it. Um, it's actually made out of a stiffened paste buckram. So it's linen that's been stiffened with hide glue. And that provides all the support that you need um, for these gowns. There's no boning that's being used during this time period, although we'll see it come in at the end of the century and I will address that a little bit later. In the next image, you see my kirtle that's worn over the petticoat and I have sleeves attached. And then you've got the, that semi-fitted gown with the puff on the sleeve to give emphasis on the shoulder. There's also another style of gown and it's probably my favorite style of gown from the entire 16th century. Um, this low necked um, gown, it has that curve to the bodice and now instead of having the neck and chest open as we had it in the Henrician period, it's almost always gonna be filled in with a decorative partlet and ruff. So here we still see that emphasis at the shoulder, although this is a one piece sleeve that tapers down um, to the wrist, still very close fitting. And her skirt is most likely being held out with a farthingale. For many of the fitted um, or semi-fitted gowns that we were looking at earlier, they probably weren't worn a, with a farthingale, but these almost certainly were. And just more images of a very similar style gown. And here, I love this image on the right because you can see all that beautiful um, pearls and embroidery that is that are decorating partlets now because they've become so fashionable to wear you're finding all sorts of embellishment on partlets during this period. More examples um, and a new style of shoulder treatment, these, the sort of roll or puff here in the late 1560s, the really exquisite partlets and the trim on both of their bodices is very similar and it serves to help kind of create a more narrow look to the torso when you have those diagonal lines leading to one single point and then just emphasizing that rounded neckline on the bodice. So this is something that a more average woman would be wearing. Again, that fitted or semi-fitted gown worn over a kirtle, very, very um, common and fashionable throughout the 16th century, but this is the 1560s version of that. So I wanna talk a little bit about ruffs themselves since they're so iconic, but I think a bit misunderstood in terms of how they work. They almost seem like they defy gravity in a way, but this is um, a satirical image because there are monkeys here um, going through all the steps that are necessary for starching, ironing, and setting ruffs. And I'm going to take a close up here because on the left is a ruff that I made before it has been ironed. So the figure eight curls, or they're called sets in the period, are actually not part of the ruff itself. It, that's not how it's constructed. It's actually just gathered to a band and then the figure eights or sets are put into the ruff by ironing it. And here you see that the monkey woman on the, the right who is seated is ironing um, a ruff that is damp with starch and she's using what's called a poking stick in the period. You may have heard it called a goffering iron later, but that's not the term used in the 16th century. And the goffering iron is made out of iron. And you can see the little monkey on the other side is heating up coals in a brazier. And it's the heat from the coals that heats up the iron, very much like a modern curling iron. And then that is what is used to create the sets. Depending on the size of the poking stick, that's the size of the set that you get for your rough. And the size of the set will change throughout the century as we will see. So these are, this is a rough that I made and you can see it both on a stand and on me as well. And the size of the set again is just created through ironing and starch. There's nothing else, there's no wire, um, there's no tricks here, no plastic horsehair braid or anything like that. It's not pinned together. Um, it's all through the magic of 
ironing and starching that that's created. So moving into the 1570s is when we start to see fashion on its up, upward climb as things just get bigger and bigger. And this is really where it starts. There's still emphasis at the shoulder now on these very vertical shoulder rolls, but you'll notice that the shoulders are getting wider. The shoulder rolls are sitting further away from the neck, almost off the shoulder to create as wide of a look as possible. And this is really to help create an illusion because if you have very wide shoulders and a very wide skirt, it will make your waist look smaller without having to do anything to your waist itself. I also want to point out that the set of the ruff, the figure eight of the ruff, has gotten much wider than it was in the 1560s. Not only have the, the size of the figure eight of the ruff gotten bigger, but also sleeves themselves have gotten bigger. Remember in the 1560s it was a very slim sleeve that fit very closely to the arm, um, but now it's gotten quite big, um, very full sleeves here. And you'll notice that the ruffs at the wrist are in proportion to the ruff at the neck. And here again is the 1570s version of that semi-fitted gown being worn over a kirtle, the gown having a high neck and a collar and the kirtle being low neck. And you can see the, the kirtles distinguished very well here on the right in this image by Lucas to here. There also becomes a fashion that really takes off in the 1570s of women wearing gowns with high necked bodices or even really doublet style bodices. Doublets of course being a male garment. And so there is some ridicule there, especially from Puritans. Um, such as a man named Stubbs. He often writes satirically about how women are almost dressing like men because they're wearing these doublet style bodices. But you really see this take off in the 1570s. So we have Elizabeth here, and she often is depicted in this style in the 1570s and 1580s, almost exclusively um, from that point onward. And um, Lady Paget here also in a doublet style as well, the ruffs, now that we're heading into the late 1570s, the ruffs are getting much larger now. In the 1580s, things reach really their, their biggest in terms of width. Um, and we see the biggest sleeves, the biggest ruffs, and the biggest skirt. Um, and you'll notice that the shoulder point that had started to get wider and wider in the 1570s is really at its widest in the 1580s. So you have very much an, like an inverted triangle look to women's bodice, women's torsos in this time, where it's very wide at the top and it comes narrower at the waist. So it's, it is interesting that even though things reach an extreme during this time period, it's still very balanced that you, the size of the ruff is in proportion to the size of the sleeve and the size of the skirt. And you also may have noticed that the size of the hair has gotten much bigger as well. And this was a style known as frizzing. So the hair would be very tightly curled and then you would brush it out to create this heart-shaped style. And this is um, something that you see um, in the 1580s here. And some rare full length images. Um, and you can see just how wide things have gotten, especially in the skirt. Although comparing both of these images, obviously the one on the left is much wider than the one on the right. It's hard to say which of the two is a more accurate depiction of um, the width of Elizabeth's gowns, but I'd say it's probably somewhere in the middle. But the one on the left is, is just really good for showing how extreme in terms of width things have gotten in the 1580s. So all of those images that we looked at just now from the 1580s showed those doublet style high necked bodices, but there are still the lower cut bodices um, that are still being worn during this time period. And these are some examples of them. However, you'll still notice the sleeves are really big still, the ruff is very big and the hair as well. And I also just love Elizabeth Bridges' little dog <laughs> in the bottom of the portrait with her. So there's a reason um, that things are able to get so big during the 1580s. And it's probably because this is when we begin to see whalebone being used 
extensively in fashion for really the first time in fashion history. Most people associate whalebone and boning in corsets with the 19th century, um, but it begins here in the 16th century. Now whalebone is a bit of a misnomer because it's not bone at all. It's actually baleen, which is a keratin substance. So the same thing that your fingernails and hair are made out of. And baleen comes from obviously the mouths of baleen whales. And it's the plates that hang down from the mouth of the whale you can see here on the left. And it's the hairs on the plates just thousands and thousands of plates in the mouth of the whale that catch um, krill and fish and those sorts of things that the, the whale will then swallow. The thing about whale bone is that it is incredibly flexible. Um, it gets cut down from these plates that are harvested from the mouth of the whale into whatever size, whatever thickness and flexibility you need. And the other thing about whalebone is that it is a thermoplastic. So as it's heated, it will form and retain the shape of whatever it's molded to, including the human body. So that makes bodices or bodies of the 16th century that are boned with whalebone actually very comfortable because it's molding to your figure as opposed to really um, altering you. So whalebone is not just used um, in bodies or bodices, as I'll talk about later, but they create an understructure for those really big sleeves that we've been seeing in the 1580s. And they become known as farthingale sleeves because it's sort of like having a little hoop skirt for your arms. And it's actually in farthingales that we see the earliest references to whalebone as early as 1582 in the wardrobe of Queen Elizabeth. She has a, um, a farthingale that's actually remade to have whalebone in it. So she is adopting new fashions as they become available. And um, this, however, is not the very first time that whalebone was used in a farthingale. Actually, Mary, Queen of Scots, beat her to it and in 1562 had a whalebone farthingale. But remember that Mary had spent time in France and it seems to be that the French were using whalebone earlier than the English and it took time for it to really take off here. But by 1585, um, we see farthingale sleeves specifically mentioned in Elizabeth's wardrobe. Of course, that very extreme large style that we're seeing um, on Elizabeth and other very elite women is not what most women are wearing. And here we can see some images from some gentlewoman, so still well-to-do women, and it's, it's a much less extreme silhouette. We don't see the huge skirt. The sleeves, however, are still large, not as large as we saw on Elizabeth and her ladies, but still large in a way that's trying to keep up with fashion. And you'll see these ladies here again are wearing that tried and true semi-fitted um, gown worn over a kirtle. And that it just seems to be very popular with this class of women and slightly lower, so that sort of middling class, just a, a true mainstay of the wardrobe for these women. Now the 1590s is when things go a bit crazy. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put it. I don't think that prior to the 1590s, Western fashion saw anything quite so unnatural. When you look at this, there's really nothing about it that looks like the natural human form. Um, and there's really just nothing to compare it to. And a lot of this has to do with whalebone becoming much more prevalent in how garments are constructed. It really allows you to have these huge understructures because the bents or the reeds and grasses that were being used before can't maintain really large circles, they'll collapse on themselves. But whalebone, however, essentially being, if you think of it like plastic, can maintain those larger shapes. So in the 1590s, sort of beginning in the late 1580s, but really in the 1590s and is when we see a new shape of farthingale. And you'll notice that there's this very harsh line where it drops off. It's no longer that tapering cone. It's very um, straight. There's a really straight drop off. And sometimes it's called a drum farthingale for by modern um, 
costume historians because it gives that sort of shape to the skirt. And you'll also notice that the bodice has become very elongated, but that's really just at the center front. In the back and the sides of the bodice, it'll still be at the natural waistline, but the front of the bodice is really long because they're trying to create this very extreme shape. The ruff is also very large and the sleeves are still large here. So I mentioned a little bit about whalebone being used in bodies. Now this is may not look very revolutionary, but this is actually incredibly revolutionary in the history of women's Western fashion. Prior to the late 1580s and 1590s, what we think of as the forerunner of the corset did not exist. Um, as I mentioned before, the bodies of my petticoat um, were stiffened with fabric, layers of fabric that had been stiffened with glue and quilted together. So there was no boning being used to provide support to the figure. But by the 1590s, we see boning being used in bodies. So channels are stitched in layers of fabric, and then the pieces of whalebone are shaved down to fit very snugly into those channels, and they get slid into the channels there. So we see Elizabeth Vernon on the left, very scandalously portrayed at her toilette, getting ready, but you can just barely see in this image the channels there of her boning. And the the image in the middle is of a pair of bodies that didn't belong to Elizabeth because they were created just after her death, but they were created by her tailor for the, her effigy, which was going to be carried around in a funeral procession. Um, so it gives us a, a good idea of the kind of bodies that Elizabeth was wearing at the end of her life. But in Elizabeth's wardrobe accounts, the first record that we see of bodies with whalebone is in 1590 and she has a French bodies with whalebone made up for her in carnation taffeta so sort of pinky color and it's from this point on really that women's the stiffening for women's gowns or women's clothing is going to come from a separate garment and then a gown will be worn over it as opposed to having the stiffening being integral to the gown itself. Now I mentioned the change in farthingale shape. Um, and this is something that seems to very clearly come from the French as opposed to the Spanish farthingale of earlier periods. And we don't have any surviving French farthingales from this period that we know of at this time. So there's possibly still one out there and let's keep our fingers crossed. But we do have this image from the 1590s of costumes made for a mask and we see the women wearing petticoats over a French farthingale. And it's possible, costume historians believe, that the men on the left are wearing just French farthingales. So this is what has really informed um, our idea of what a French farthingale might look like. Uh, but hopefully, as time goes on, we may be able to learn a little bit more, perhaps get that, you know, much sought after image or, or extant to help us even more. But for now, this is what we think it might have looked like. As I mentioned before though, that very extreme shape, very unnatural shape that we saw on Elizabeth early on is not what's being worn by the majority of women. However, they're still taking influence from what Elizabeth is wearing. So you can see there's still a similar shape to the skirt here where it comes out pretty straight from the waist, but then drops off. It's just done with a much smaller farthingale, perhaps even a roll um, that is being worn tight around the waist to give that emphasis just right at the hips. The sleeves are still large, the ruff is still large, but again, nothing quite like what we're seeing on Elizabeth in that portrait. So, um, that is a very quick, very brief um, overview of 50 years um, of changing fashions during Elizabeth's reign. And I wanted to end on these two images together to show the change in Elizabeth as well as the change in fashion from the beginning of her reign to the very end of her reign. And to think about everything that's happened during her time.
as well. It's, it's a time during of English history that is one of the most popular times because of so many things that happen. And there are so many changes that happen as well in fashion. So hopefully as you're going through your own personal reading and research of Tudor history, as we all love it, this talk will hopefully have given you um, some ideas about what Elizabeth, her ladies, those key players looked like um, during that time period. And I will turn it over to Heather to answer questions. Awesome.